Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the CEOs for Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we have pulled together and built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration and communication tools for life science companies. We actually have helped people with everything from virtualizing their advisory boards, medical education, investigator meetings, rollouts of their brand plans to their internal staff and all kinds of corporate meetings. And we do it in a way where they can do this longitudinally over time. So it's not just a one all be all interaction. It can be done uh, efficiently and cost effectively over time. But more importantly, we really believe at Impetus that everything starts with a conversation. And from some of these big, hairy, audacious conversations, we can work with some of the provocateurs, the leading edge thinkers in healthcare, some of the people who are the entrepreneurs and bleeding edge technology, so that we can collectively and positively work together to disrupt healthcare. And so I'm really pleased to have one of these leading edge thinkers at the table with me today. And this is Emma Lynch. Um, Emma Lynch is the founder of two companies. Uh, one is called EQ Vibration, and we're going to get into that today because that's something that she's really sinking her teeth into, as well as a company called Quadrant 2 Medical. Um, she was also the founding me uh, member of Medical Affairs Consulting. She holds a PhD degree in cell and molecular biology from the University of Notre Dame, as well as a master's degree in pharmaceutical medicine from Trinity College. She has worked um, over 15 years and has experience as a medical director in the pharmaceutical industry. And she's worked for a variety of different companies, including Pfizer Healthcare in Ireland, Astellas, and UCB in Fire, um, Pharma in Ireland. So welcome, Emma. So happy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So a very interesting background. We obviously share the fact that we were both in pharma and had lots of experience in, in that. So tell us a little bit about some of these nuggets and the pearls of wisdom that you learned over the trajectory of your career, which brings you to what you've established with these, you know, as an entrepreneur and starting businesses uh, as, as we see them today. What brought you to, to your place? Okay, so I suppose I started out at a young age where, like many, education is a pillar in, in my family household where we were taught that education is really, really important. And so there's a huge emphasis on the IQ, you know, get your skill set in a particular area. So I obviously went down the cell and molecular biology road. Um, and when I kind of, I'd done my PhD, I had embarked on the master's in pharmaceutical medicine, you know, and I was beginning to partner that with the pharmaceutical industry. I really realized, well, how do I make things happen? How can I influence projects? How can I listen better? And that's when I began to kind of delve into the area of emotional intelligence to improve, you know, my clarity about how I approach different projects, how I listen to people. And so once I began to crack the nut of emotional intelligence, my own patterns of thinking, I began to have a lot more clarity in my thought. And so the IQ space of the, you know, the life sciences, biology side, coupled with the emotional intelligence side, I began to find my productivity increased, my effectiveness increased. And in the last more recent times, um, I suppose I, I began to have a lot more creative, innovative ideas myself. And so I began to say, okay, well, I follow my passion and overcome my fears, my own personal fears to go out on my own to, 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 make, uh, to make my company happen. And I suppose the products that I believed could serve patients happen. Lovely. There's so many great things that you've said there, and we're going to kind of linger on, on each of these components to sort of build the story, because there's so much that we can all learn from, especially since we're in this post or this pandemic world, this COVID-19 world. There's a new normal. People are obviously looking to reset, reestablish, and potentially launch off into new areas in their own life. So let's actually talk for a few minutes about emotional intelligence. Tell us a little bit about what that means and how people can learn more about emotional intelligence. Okay, so emotional intelligence, I came to emotional intelligence because I suppose I was feeling, um, I felt I wasn't as effective as I could be. I had a lot of knowledge, I had a lot of IQ, you know, kind of built up over years in a certain niche area and I wanted to become more effective. 
I was finding that, you know, I was ended up picking up a lot of administrative tasks and not really executing on what I wanted to really deliver for a patient and a healthcare professional. So I began to tap into me and realize that actually, you know, that, um, that kind of heaviness that I was beginning to feel was actually trying to teach me something. So I began to learn that my emotions were the language that I needed to listen to. And so the more I listened to them, I realized the heavier emotions, whether I was, you know, tired or drained, it was my body's way of letting me go. You're pulling away from your passion and you're going down the wrong road. So the more I saw that as resistance and realized, OK, what is my body trying to teach me and began to reorient myself? Well, what am I passionate about and become more and more aligned within myself? I began to realize, you know, I'd. I was abundant with energy. I had so much, um, I had so much excitement. It really helped me align with, let's say, what the healthcare professional wanted, the patient needed, and I suppose aligned with, you know, what really, really excited me. So I suppose it comes back to the core of, do you know how to engage with your own emotions? I had gone down, you know, the college academic road. My mind was, you know, sharpened for clarity on concepts and how to apply concepts and data and statistics. So my mind was sharp from thinking, but I, I realized I was massively living in my head and applying concepts, but not really connecting my mind body experience. So once I began to make that connection between the two and began to really, you know, tap into the heaviness or the lower vibrational energies of my emotions and began to realize, OK, they're trying to teach me something. And what are those unmet needs that I have? And once I began to tap into that, you know, my energy started to flow. Um, very interesting concept because we all come, or many of us come from that scientific, the scientific rigor, um, the, you know, the way that we do design of studies and things like that. And there's, you know, life is mathematical. It's black and white. Yeah. There's a right and if there's a wrong. And so we've all been attuned and also the mm -hmm. teaching and the medical education that's been applied at the healthcare and in the life sciences um, jurisdiction that's very much in tow with that. So it's the living in the head that you've talked about and the concept of associating with your body feels very woo woo to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Now that a lot of people had an opportunity to work from home and, you know, there's more time to think, um, what would you say to other people, for example, in the medical affairs, medical science liaisons, um, around how to explore what you mean by connecting with your body. Okay, so I suppose um, it's about identifying what are you feeling? So are you feeling tired? Are you feeling, you know, a heaviness? Are you feeling drained? And so if you have that feeling, you know, after you ask yourself, what is that feeling I'm experiencing? Ask yourself next, well, what is my unmet need? What do I need here? You know, do I need to feel passionate about something? Do I need clarity on my strategy? Do I, and once you connect emotionally with that energy, that heaviness of that energy, and you connect with your needs, once you identify that need, you get a flow of energy of that tiredness, that heaviness, that energy be, turns into momentum. And it, it begins to connect with the need, if the need, if you've identified the right need. Now, sometimes you'll kind of go, oh, I think I need clarity, yeah, it's clarity. And two or three weeks later, you might be like, no, I, I feel this resistance again. I suppose it's about your, that resistance in your body is saying, okay, that, that need is not the correct one at this time in this moment. So it's about, okay, well, what else do I need? What, are, what am I, could be my other unmet needs? And so as you kind of triage and over a course of weeks, you begin to identify more kind of clearly what those needs are. And when you click on that right need in that right moment, your momentum of that heaviness, that energy begins to flow. And so you begin to get excited about learning and getting that clarity, or, you know, if you have a need for, a need to be heard, you have, a, you, have a, you know, a new engaged energy that drives in to meet that need. And so your building blocks become your own building blocks that you begin to unravel in your own way. And so I suppose that's why in emotional intelligence, you know, it comes with a huge amount of judgment because, you know, emotions in the past are, you know, somebody's angry and they overreact. And that's typically what people see as emotion. Um, but there's a, a true mastery to your emotion if you really tune into yourself and realize that your emotions are energy and the energy is trying to direct you in the right way for you, for your journey. And so once you connect with that right, you know, that unmet need, um, the energy just transforms into momentum. 
a lot of people who will be listening to this may, you know, again, coming from a little bit more of a skeptical scientific perspective and say, uh, some individuals might be saying, you know, I'm so busy, uh, you know, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. You know, I've got the kids going on and I'm trying to homeschool them and I've got, you know, a call with several physicians and a medical education event. How do you counsel people that you work in your consulting mm -hmm. business to find the perspective and to be able to allow oneself to listen to that so-called energy? Some people don't even really have the right lingo or language for that because they've been so disassociated and disconnected yeah. for many, many, many years. So what would be some of the steps that you would take somebody through to sort of take them from that, that paradigm of I'm so busy, I can't even you know, think to mm -hmm. taking resonance and understanding or feeling their vibrational energy? Okay. Yeah. So I totally identify with the person, you know, who's overwhelmed and doesn't even identify with their emotion because I was once there. Um, and I suppose the first step is to say, you know, that you really, you want, you want something more, you want something different. And so when somebody comes to me, typically somebody's at that junction when they come to speak to me. And so I'll typically tap into their mind first because that's where they're used to being. And so if you look at all the studies around productivity and effectiveness of productivity, there it kind of works in a bell curve. So if you are overwhelmed and too busy, you end up in a drained, tired state and your productivity begins to fall off. If you are not fully aligned with what you're doing or you're passionate about, it results in procrastination. So they're the two bottom pieces of the productivity curve. When you're fully aligned with what you're doing and you're not overtired, your effectiveness and productivity is the top of the bell curve. So if you really want to be effective and productive in your role, you really need to learn how to stay within that you know, peak of the bell curve. So it's your emotions that you know, guide you in that space. The earlier emotions are, are you passionate about what you do? Because if you're passionate, you won't procrastinate. And the other end is if you're overwhelmed and drained or you're, you know, you're starting to show signs of you know, illness or sickness or, um, or you're just feeling overwhelmed all the time, it's really important for your role and your success in your career to come back into a, a zone of productivity and effectiveness. So I suppose normally when I talk about that bell curve, people start saying, okay, I, I now have a, you know, a carrot at the end of the stick to say, yes, I want to be productive. I want my career to progress. So they want to learn how to touch into those emotions to keep them within that productivity bell curve. Fantastic. It's so many cool things there and such an interesting approach. As many companies are looking for novel ways of engaging and training and, um, and inspiring their staff, um, this is a really interesting area. So I'm just curious if your consulting business or this area around the EQ vibration um, is something that companies are tapping into to look for ways of invigorating their medical affairs departments. Yeah, so EQ Vibration, we're an online uh, platform. And so we're going to launch our first, first product um, in uh, hopefully by the end of December. And so it's a foundation, just three part webinar series. And then in, in spring next year, we will have a six to eight week course. So it's about tapping, getting, you know, getting people to identify with their emotions and taking them on that journey so that they can self attribute all of the concepts themselves. And um, so at the moment, a lot of my work is one on one or teaching classes. And so we're beginning to transition into that online teaching platform um, by the end of this month. I love it. And everything is going that way. And so now yeah. you're tapping into a potentially global audience. Now, what's really interesting is we've got the pre-COVID world and we have the post-COVID world and things, as we all know, has ex this has been an era of acceleration and of dispersion and all kinds of other um, potentialities here. And one of the things that has always been in, in, in progress is the increasing uh, importance of the medical affairs departments in, in pharmaceutical life science companies. And we have never seen that more so than today. So yeah. can you speak a little bit about what you have seen as being the evolution in the increasing dominance of the medical affairs departments in these companies? 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. So when I first came into the medical affairs world, we were very much an enabling function. And um, so it was everything commercial needed and we responded. So it became a very, um, I suppose, codependent relationship. They asked, we gave. And in recent times, um, that has transitioned now to where medical affairs, you know, globally within companies is its independent, own independent silo within the organization that is forging forward to establish and gather insights out in the external healthcare setting to bring it back into the company to drive strategy. Um, so that transition for me as I was going through uh, different companies, you know, really required a different mindset from medical affairs staff to go from that kind of enabling position to a position where you are now a leader and thought leader in your space. And you now needed to manage the internal demands as well as drive that in external face. So it's a really exciting time for medical affairs in the last number of years and the next number of years to come. Um, because of the depth of the knowledge that medical affairs holds, um, you know, you can really have great and amazing conversations out in the healthcare setting to understand what are the needs of the healthcare professional and of you know, the nursing staff and of the patient in order to bring some really innovative uh, products or formulations to the market or new products to the market in order to you know, drive company success and obviously patient, uh, patient success. Emma, you're doing an amazing job of leveraging the groundswell of momentum of the digitalization of the world that we live in today and mm -hmm. leveraging this for a global audience to educate people on what it is that you do and around the emotional intelligence associated with being this and being your best self. And you have done this as a niche in the medical affairs or in the medical space. So how would you, you know, mention this or discuss this with either your clients or just people in medical affairs in general? Uh, curiosity and maybe some, you know, off, offness, uh, you know, being, you know, pushing aside the digital and being a bit scared of it, or there's some fears. What would you say to people like that um, to inspire them to be able to start really working with their client base, the physicians, the nurses, allied healthcare providers, and leveraging technology? What would be some of the steps you would encourage them to take in order for them to get really comfortable with the technologies around them? Yeah, I suppose in the pharma world, um, typically we're slow to engage with technology. And I think now is the time where pharma are really starting to change that model. Um, and I think it's going to be really crucial to uh, pharma's, I suppose, been a really strong stakeholder in the conversation. Um, once you get a healthcare professional, I suppose, that wants to engage in a digital platform, it's about finding your tribe. And so it's about finding that healthcare professional that wants to engage in that way. And once you begin to, you know, engage with thought leaders who want to act in this way, and as a pharmaceutical company, you engage with them at that place together, you can then begin to start the dialogue and others will come. So there's a huge amount of skepticism and, um, you know, people tend to like, you know, not like change and like to stay where they are, but it's about meeting, understanding those people who want to lead from the front and who want to get involved. And it's about having the conversation with those people there and the others will come in time. And it's a really great opportunity for, you know, medical affairs, medical science liaisons to be able to understand that they have an opportunity today of doing a one to many. Traditionally, when we've been focusing on the single one, one-on-one -on -one in person meeting, which again has a lot of effectiveness, but you know, with the avail availability, you know, again, you know, here's a, a quick little commercial for impetus, these asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration, you know, opportunities and platforms, these MSLs now have an opportunity to speak to a myriad of people at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what can you say about what medical education is going to look like in the future? Yeah, like my, I think I think COVID has kind of forced everybody to go to this space. And to me, it's the silver lining because, you know, as the world gets more and more connected, it only means better patient outcomes. And um, it will allow for, you know, a quicker, faster dialogue across multiple markets, across multiple hospitals. And um, so like if, if um, if a pharmaceutical company, you know, had a certain therapeutic area they were covering, they can now run, you know, a difficult case study 
um, across a digital platform and bring in experts from the States, Europe, wherever, in order to help hospitals in their own you know, country in order to drive treatment plans for patients. So I suppose it's it's a, it's more connectedness, and um, you know I really think there's a massive opportunity for the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare professional to really come together in the one place in a in a really agile way that really can deliver better patient outcomes. When you start working with your clients, Emma, there's probably a lot of need and uh, and focus on things like establishing a team's vision and a strategy for excellence. What would be some of the nuggets that you share with teams when you discuss this as, as it relates specifically to this whole idea about being aware of your body and your feelings and your emotions? Mm -hmm. So typically what I've seen is, um, you know, strategies will come and they're clear. However, you know, companies can't get engagement then in market or they will get some level of traction, that, but not full traction on, on the strategy that they want to deploy. And I suppose the, the core learning for me is in order to, you know, make sure that a strategy can be really, really effective, you must first know, you know, the in-market colleagues, where are they at? Because if they're overwhelmed and they don't have the space to take it on, it's going to fall semi-flat. So I suppose a lot of the conversations I would have had is about, yes, we want to take that strategy on, but first we must create space. And so in order to create space, you need to know where people are at. Are they overwhelmed? Are they, you know, how are they currently running their day? Um, and so to really understand the needs of the, in per, of the in-market colleague and then about creating the space and then slotting in the needs of the strategy and the clarity of the strategy, then that's the recipe for momentum and energy to really move in the right direction. But typically what happens is strategy comes, it's pushed, um, and that connect step doesn't happen to create the space. Um, and so without that space being created, there's no place for the energy to go. The energy in market is heavy. There's more coming down, adds to the heaviness. And so we need to listen to that heaviness that the in-market colleagues are experiencing in order for that energy to be channeled into the right place to create space to allow strategy in to really drive forward. So very interesting perspective, Emma, around approaching business and sales and conversation and influence from a emotional or a feeling place, as opposed to from a concrete mathematical place. So one of the other key areas that you probably cover with your clients is around collaboration and insight gathering. Um, and just play, you know, just generally conversing with healthcare providers. And what sorts of insight or advice would you give to medical affairs, medical science liaisons as it relates to plugging in to the energetic level of the people you're engaging with. Because we oftentimes have to realize we're not energetic bodies uh, alone ourselves as islands in the world. It's energies interacting with other people's energies. How would you educate on that and giving advice on the dynamics of how to manage that so that positive energy can move from them to the people they're trying to speak with? Yeah. So the, I suppose the space of gathering really valuable insights comes back to the core of the relationship between two people. So I've mentioned this before, and I'm not sure, Natalie, if you've heard me mention it, but the relationship of three between, let's say, myself and a healthcare professional. So in order to really understand the relationship of three, you need to remember, you know, I have a relationship with myself, a healthcare pro professional has a relationship with themselves. And then the quality of the relationship between us is relationship number three. And so it's only if that quality of that relationship is really, really high, that I can gather really, really high quality insights that can really begin to drive strategy within the organization. So if I deepen my relationship with myself, I'm in a much better place to listen and ask questions of the healthcare professional to truly understand their unmet needs. Now, if I have clarity within myself, you know, about what I need to know and what my strategy, what my strategy is from a company perspective, I need to park that for one moment to go in to have the conversation with the healthcare professional to truly understand, well, what's their strategy? What do they need? What are their unmet needs? And so as you deepen your relationship with yourself, you get calmer and calmer in, you know, you don't react to anything that the healthcare professional says. Everything you hear from them, you realize it's 100% about them. And that any emotional, any emotional energy that rises with you as you resolve it 
and um, heal it and repair it, the next time you go into the conversation, you hear them with a deeper lens. So once you hear them with a deeper lens, you begin to uncover deeper and deeper insights. And so it's about going on that relationship with the healthcare professional, first clearing all your own you know, relationship stuff about what comes up for you when the healthcare professional speaks, creating that space with the, within you to then be able to hear the healthcare professional and ask deeper questions so they can gather uh, really deep insights of what their unmet needs are. So it's about Maybe. understanding that dynamic. Many people who are listening to have probably dabbled, if not very involved with meditation. And for anybody who has tried to attempt that particular uh, thing in your life, it can be very challenging to get really quiet and to do the things that you're saying, which is to quiet the vibration and just to let whatever is gonna to flow to you naturally, almost like an energy channel. So one of the reasons for the challenge is that we live in a very distractible world. There's actually a book written by your, um, uh, I forgot his name, it's a book called Indistractable. Um, and he actually wrote a book also called Hooked. And we, we live in a dopamine dripping world with you know, uh, social media and beeps and blurps and everything's trying to buy for our attention. And so we have this really short attention span for anything and we're just busy consuming data. What kinds of advice would you give to people to be able to quiet their mind so that their vibration is in such a place where they can actually attract and really listen to somebody else. Okay, so I suppose I'm hands up, I'm years on the journey and I still struggle with meditation. Um, and I think it's because I was for so many years so deeply entrenched in, you know, in my head, in the IQ, you know, learning concepts, applying concepts, memorizing concepts, regurgitating for exams, everything was in my head. So to get to a place where you can really master meditation and apply it in your world, I do feel I'm getting closer to that place. And um, my mind has dramatically quietened, but I had to meet my mind where my mind was at. So I needed to learn the IQ of emotional intelligence first and to understand the thought patterns that were good for me and the thought pat patterns that weren't. And once I began to observe those kind of thought patterns or the emotions within me and realized, OK, that feels good, that doesn't feel good, or I feel that, yeah, this is my unmet need, I began to unpack it from a head IQ space. And so now as I do that, my mind gets quieter and quieter and I feel I'm getting closer to a place where I could actually meditate. Um, but for me early on, I was like, everybody's talking about meditation, but I just can't do it. I can't quiet my mind in a moment like that. Um, so I think you need to have um, a huge level of acceptance for yourself where you're at and say my life's journey brought me in a really strong IQ space. I first need to meet myself there and then wind down to get the balance between the IQ and the EQ. And I do feel I'm getting closer to meditation, but uh, yeah, I'm not there yet. Oh, that's fantastic. What would you say to people in terms of the reality of how one can co-create reality with somebody else? And that's kind of getting really deep down the rabbit hole of this woo-woo stuff that we're talking about. Yes, like yes. When two people become clear, um, how can that change the dynamics when two people are actually conversing with each other? And I'm talking specifically around the medical affairs individual with, you know, an allied healthcare worker, physician, et cetera, is that how can that conversation purely transport itself into a manifesting into a new thing that neither person would have been able to get to by themselves? Yeah, so I suppose like as you deepen your relationship with yourself and that your emotional intelligence matures, you begin to notice other people that are at the same depth of emotional intelligence as yourself, as where they are in their journey. And so when you find people like that, um, the vibe, the energy is on another level. There isn't heaviness, there isn't, there isn't drama, there isn't negativity, and it's a really positive space. And if something might spark, you know, an idea between you might spark immediately, it might take time. Um, but when you have a connection with somebody like that, there's a huge amount of clarity in your conversations and there's a huge amount of depth in your conversations. And typically with somebody like that, something will, you know, an idea will come and it will come to fruition very quickly. And it will begin to grow and, and begin to, you know, gather moss over time. So um, as you go deeper and deeper on that journey, 
yeah, you, you make those connections. They're not as, as frequent, uh, but when you make them, they really can have a massive impact. A lot of times we hear, we've heard all kinds of coaching and relationship counseling on how to listen and, you know, listening more and you've got two ears and one mouth and we hear a lot about this, but doing it is a completely different animal. And so sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. I'm sure we've all been in conversations where somebody's interrupting you or you could tell that somebody's already thinking while you're talking and not really listening to you and just wanting to interject Mm -hmm. and get their opinions across. What does it feel like when somebody is really listening to you? So I suppose the other person is, you, you know, by their body language, you know, by their energy that they're literally, they're fully grounded and that they're truly listening to the question to understand what it is you need to know. And so, whereas somebody who's trying to interject and it, they're anxious, they're, they're trying to get their message across there. It, they're, it's about them. But when somebody truly comes to the conversation to listen, the other person, you'll see them, they're grounded. They, they're listening for the question. They're listening for the nuances in the question to truly understand it. So the energy is a lot calmer. Um, whereas if somebody is, you know, their tempo is up, it's not to judge, it's to have, everybody has to go on their journey in their own time, in their own way. It's to know that, you know, you have to make a decision, how much energy are you going to invest in this moment with this individual, you know, where the conversation is at. Um, And I know in some situations in work, you know, there's certain people you need to work with and you need to find ways, but it's about, you know, learning how to follow your emotions and learning how to put in boundaries. But when somebody is truly listening, um, there's a calmness about the conversation. The other person is truly listening to the question been asked because you understand it's their unmet need. They're asking something for clarity. So you truly listen and answer them with clarity. One of the things that I think is not an issue, but it has been historically uh, found in pharmaceutical companies are the metrics for measuring success. We obviously have different measurements for actual sales promotional teams. And certainly there's measurements as it relates to the medical science liaisons. What kinds of suggestions would you make for changing metrics? For example, we find effectiveness being in, you know, influence levels or engagement levels or certain things that you're fundamentally finding, which is the the objectives of the organization, which may not necessarily be in concert with what the person that you're speaking to, physician, nurse, whatever their objectives are. If you were to you know, wave a magic wand and speak to a series of pharmaceutical companies and reestablishing success metrics for the conveyance of medical information and foundational scientific information, what would that be? Okay, so yeah, so down through the last number of years, I've given this a lot of thought and So for me, it's about number of insights gathered, but not only number of insights, because, you know, the quantitative number doesn't necessarily matter. It's about the impact of those insights. So did those insights influence, you know, a clinical trial design? Did those insights impact the design of a formulation? So it's about the impact of those insights. So initially with a team, you might need to set, you know, we need to get X number of calls. But for me, you could have one call with three amazing insights. And you know what, that's an amazing job done because that one MSL found this person on the right vibration and they really connected and really drove, you know, an amazing conversation. But it takes a huge amount of energy for that one MSL to go in a really deep relationship with themselves and a lot of meeting lots of people to have that one connection that drove something amazing. So for me, it's it's not just solely about number of insights, it's about the impact of those insights and having a ranking system for the impact of insights. Initially, yes, you'll need to set some metrics saying, you know, X number of visits, but really the, the true measure of an amazing medical affairs team is the impact of those insights within the company. So let's talk about impact for a few minutes, especially in the new normal that we're living in. Yes. We're all anxiously waiting for the imminent, you know, what are we calling it? The liquid gold of the vaccine for Mm -hmm. COVID-19. And we're now in a space where we've had moratoriums on clinical trials and that they've started again. And then there's issues and there's all kinds of dialogue going on around digital biomarkers 
and digital therapeutics and how do we put wearables and how do we keep trials going? Basically, how do we maintain innovation? How do we make sure that this doesn't stop again? How do we ensure that clinical trials remain not only efficient, but resilient? So part of this also has to do with the entailment of outcomes. Um, what would you say that in the, in the new normal with a more enlightened MSLs being much more personally connected, connected to their personal energy levels, knowing that they're, they're more of a channel of scientific information than with anything, you know, with a specific agenda coming from the company, what would you say would be some of the positive outcomes associated with clinical trials in terms of discovery in the future? Okay, and how the MSL can play a role in, in that? Yeah. Okay, so like, it all comes back to strategically what what is the focus? So, you know, if if the company, you know, because there's so many ideas, like for me, COVID, what COVID forced all the pharmaceutical companies to do was to forget about fear and just do. And so it's the same in the MSL world. Everybody's like, oh, but, you know, we won't get people on calls. We won't get people on. Forget about fear and just do. Make that phone call. Pick up the phone. You know, make sure you get those, those um, you know, questions asked. Have conversations. Have conversations in the universe around the person that you're trying to contact. Really get to know the environment really, really well. But in relation to clinical trials, um, I think there's a huge important conversation to make sure that we're factoring in the voice of the patient into those conversations. So for me, the role of the MSL needs to also ensure that the, the patient associations are included in the conversation and that we can understand the unmet needs from the healthcare perspective, understand the unmet needs from the patients themselves, and that really you can put that information together to really design a clinical trial that really will be next generation. Um, but it's making sure that you truly understand that the unmet needs, that you can listen through all the noise and really, really identify the unmet needs that are really going to move the dial. Because COVID, I suppose, lifted the veil on we must do, we don't have time. So there was no, we need to have 10 meetings to make one decision. It was one meeting, one decision, move. So um, it really lifted the fear of, well, what's going to go wrong or the fear of failure. And I, and I really think that that's where the lesson is. It's that emotional intelligence piece of people had to be courageous. They didn't have time to be fearful of the failure of something they might do. And so for MSLs, I think they really need to carry that forward, get out, network in the environment and really understand the unmet needs so that you can bring that back into clinical trial design for, for the for coming years. Absolutely. And it's really kind of interesting because when we talk about the the development of new discoveries and the development of new knowledge. It used to take 50 years for something to come into fruition. I and mean, when we think about even the way the vaccines were developed for polio and for other sorts of uh, conditions, they took many, many years. And we mm -hmm. see that COVID-19 literally took a year. We also find the same thing with, with scientific information. It's literally doubling every seven, four, 74 days. And so the question comes down to is what sorts of skills, not only just having the ability to sort of stay quiet and be able to listen and to attract this information, but what other skills are required by the MSL to be able to absorb this information really quickly and to become the conduit that they need to be in order to educate the world? I mean, I'll be honest with you, sort of setting the set, the, this, yeah. uh, the, the world, I've never seen so much mass media and general public interested in science and pharmaceutical companies until we've actually had COVID-19. You're having news channels talking about, you know, the mechanisms of action and the efficacy rates and all kinds of things. So never before have we had such an appetite for clinical and scientific information, but so much of it's developing so quickly, what sorts of skills do the MSLs need to be able to do without having to become a data scientist? Yeah, so I suppose like from an MSL's perspective, they need to understand what's trending. It comes back to clarity of focus. So what is what is the area that you're going to hone in, hone in on and be an expert on? And that you stay focused all of the time each week, setting aside your time to really become a master in that space. 
everything else is about trends. You just are aware of trends and you know enough to, to hold a conversation, but you're not a master in it. So you need to choose which area is your mastery and everything else is a high level because you can't be a master of everything. So for me, it's about uh, choosing your area of focus and then you know, driving data analytics and understanding the trending thereafter in the in, within the field and outside of the field. But it's it's clarity of purpose that it comes back to for me for, for an MSL or medical advisor. Part of this as well too is there's data everywhere. Some of the data is yeah. good, some of it's not. Reports yeah. show that we saw an unprecedented amount of tying into preprints prior to when, like, for example, COVID-19 data, et cetera, we actually made it into peer-reviewed journals. So people are tapping into sort of non-peer-reviewed and, you know, all the sorts of things. Um, so, so the, you know, ultimately the question comes down to is where does compliance fit into this and does it? Should scientific knowledge be free? Should it be a type of energy that flows freely as opposed to being blocked by legislation and compliance requirements? Yeah, look, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one because in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, everything is so heavily regulated um, that there needs to be a certain level of, you know, curated or stewardship over it. Um, and so I think from an MSL perspective, in order to, you know, reputationally protect the company, it is important that, you know, their area of mastery, that they have their select areas that they go to, you know, that are peer reviewed, that are high quality, that are well respected. Now, that's not to say you don't watch for trends of other mindsets and other, you know, theories that are really resonating with people. But again, it's important to know what's resonating and, you know, where your area of focus is. So you don't need to know everything all of the time, you know, have your five sources that you go to, to be, to have mastery within your area. And then if there is trending of other topics, whether it's peer reviewed or non peer reviewed, it's important, I think, to be aware because there's different concepts arising all of the time that mightn't have, you know, public opinion already bought in right now, but, you know, it's important to be aware of it, to really have, um, you know, an innovative conversation with the healthcare professional. But again, it comes back to what's trending within the healthcare professional world. Um, and I suppose it's, a, it's about finding those analytics to be able to be aware of that. These days, it's a really interesting discussion as, as we observe the balance that governments and other individuals, organizations, corporations, et cetera, and, and you know, the population at large trying to balance between health and economics. And there's this real skating and this, you know, this reticence around balancing, you know, the economics with science um, and that conversation in between. So with all of that said, you know, there we're always sort of skating on that sort of, or on that slippery slope when it comes to MSL speaking the science and also somewhat being involved with the, um, the market access regulatory conversation that inevitably ensues for every you know, company that's about to launch a product. How would an MSL be guided on how to maintain the integrity of science and the free flowing of that real positive energy with sometimes the pushback and the negativity that comes back with viewpoints of too expensive or this is not fair and people can't access it. So the discussion around the economics of these products. Yeah, so I, I think in a lot of scenarios, you know, there are complex environments for every market to, you know, balance the economics against the, you know, the clinical trial data and obviously the price point of a product in the market. Um, for the most part, a healthcare professional in a conversation, their unmet need is to be heard. And so there is no perfect answer in every market as to, you know, what is the best way for an MSL to navigate that conversation? In a lot of cases, you just need to allow the healthcare professional to be heard and to acknowledge you know, their frustrations. And you, know, you can also more often than not identify with their frustrations and you know, that, that it is a fine balance and that there are, it is multi-stakeholder process in order to get the right pri price point so that there is um, you know, a, a, 
an economically viable business to drive clinical trials and innovation, you know, for generations to come. Um, so I found, you know, in, in a lot of those conversations, it's just about giving a listening ear to healthcare professional to have that conversation. The MSL won't necessarily have an answer unless there are more economic studies done in the market that, you know, you can provide, but more often than not, there isn't. Um, and it's about allowing the conversation just to flow and to hear each other. That's so, so essential. I love that. Um, we talked a little bit about the patient and the patient becoming a really important part of the equation. We've talked a lot about patient centricity for many, many years, but I think never before, I think it's an unprecedented, the, the importance of involving patients. We talked a little earlier about clinical trials, but even in the future around you know, the, the ambient biometrics that are going to be entered in the general management of patients' conditions in general, if they're not gonna be able to go uh, as, as, as often to the doctor's office for doing you know, measurements and for assessments. So the patient is going to have to become very attuned and very much part of the healthcare conversation um, in the future. Where is the medical affairs MSLs play in that conversation? Yeah, so right now, I, I think the position for the MSL or medical advisor is to be in contact with the patient association so that they understand the whole ecosystem of the patient, the healthcare professional, and also obviously the nursing staff, depending if they're administering the product. Um, for me, yes, it's a huge, there's a huge space for the patient to move into because typically it's like, oh, the poor patient and it's a, it's a victim mindset for the patient. And to allow the space for the patient to really step into their own and have a voice, I think is crucial. But in a lot of cases, um, it's gonna take time for the, the patient to really hone their voice, to really have an effective conversation because they've been coming from a, you know, um, a parenting position of the healthcare system looks after me and I am in a victim's, you know, mindset for you to say you're going to take care of me. So I think that's going to be an evolving uh, mindset over the next number of years. And so as I, as it's in that infancy, as it grows, I think the best place for the medical advisor or themselves to be is in contact with the patient association, where the patient, patient association is re really refining, listening to and refining the voice of the, of the patient. And I think in time, it will be crucial to have, you know, a patient on an editorial board for a, you know, for a medical affairs strategy in time to come. But I'm not so sure that um, the patient's voices were fine enough to be there just yet. But I think I do think it's with the patient association for now. Absolutely, I love that. Love that concept. Mm -hmm. COVID nineteen and the vaccine is on everybody's lips, on everybody's minds as we sort of careen into the holiday season and beyond into a new year, um, with lots of hopes, um, some with trepidation and everything in between. Many MSLs are not directly involved with a vaccine. But many people look at them as being, you know, soothsayers or, you know, purveyors of knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give to MSLs at this current juncture of being a helping hand, of being um, an insightful leader, if you will, during, during this uh, very tenuous next several months? So I, I think the role of the MSL or medical advisor in this space is really to point whether it's, you know, general public or family members asking the question or it's in the healthcare setting. It's about pointing people towards reliable information. Again, back to the earlier part of our conversation where there's so much information out there that, you know, isn't peer reviewed. It's about, you know, when people go on to Mr. Google to ask the question that they really go to a peer reviewed, reliable source. And so, yeah, depending on where the question's coming from, it's about giving the appropriate resource, depending if you're talking to somebody who's academic or somebody who's in the clinical healthcare setting, or if it's, you know, somebody in the public or somebody in your family asking you the, that question. It's to have that established, credible voice in that space, knowing where your sources are that you can send them to. Absolutely. Do you see the pharmaceutical business model changing in the future? Historically, models have been very heavily focused or um, on the sales or promotional aspects of the business, of the brand, of the franchises, of, the, of how they sell. And there certainly has been a lot of credence placed on the medical aspect and educating people on the do's and the don'ts and, and all the intricacies, intricacies associated with the science. 
Do you see that model changing in the future? Yes, yeah, so I, I suppose in time I do. I think now in the last couple of years, obviously as medical affairs has become, come from an enabling function more to its own independent, um, you know, siloed function. Um, and as it begins to establish its feet and gets clarity about what its purpose and vision is, and it begins to execute on those, gathering those insights. I think once that traction is built within medical affairs, the true value of medical affairs will really begin to shine. Um, and I do think that that model internally, but the internal structure of the company will begin to change around those insights. But it's for medical affairs, I think, first to get that insight gathering right, to really show the value that they can bring back into the organization. And I think once that happens, yes, in time then after that, I think the organization, you know, the org chart will look, will look, start to look quite different. We're living in the era of the great dispersion. And I take that term uh, from somebody that I, I follow and really respect, Scott Galloway. And when we talk about dispersion, we already realize that a lot of people are working from myriad of places. And that's kind of been the reality for MSLs. They, a lot of them are just not located in a central office. But with this great dispersion also comes the potential for the democratization for everybody to have their own business, just like yourself, PhD educated, working for big pharma, decided to go out and follow one's passion and start their own entrepreneurial endeavor. Is this going to become a new reality for a lot of MSLs? And if so, what would that look like? Um, yeah, so I suppose, yeah, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, and the reason, and maybe just to paint a little bit more on that is, could the future of MSLs potentially be not just representing the products for one company? Could they eventually start an entrepreneurial where they become a free agent? Um, and I'll give you, I'll paint a picture for you, for example, journalism at one point used to be a very provocative and very lucrative type of business. The newspaper industry obviously got outshone by digital media and, you know, watching news on Google, et cetera. But there's been a resurgence or an ability for journalists to find their voice using Twitter and other things and setting up channels that people have and they have followership and can actually create their own, their own mechanisms for um, you know, their own gigs, if you will, in the gig economy with having a followership and people pay for them on, with their, their media and their, their insights or their journalism, art, journalistic articles through subscriptions. Is that something that could potentially be followed suit with MSLs? Potentially it could, um, you know, depending on, uh, you know, the ambitions of, of an MSL. And I think, I think where MSL medical advisors are at based on their insights that they're gathering, you know, and their academic experience that they're bringing to the table, coupled with if they have an entrepreneurial drive or not, I suppose it's whether, you know, they can navigate that, you know, in tandem with the pharmaceutical company at the, at the same time and flourish it together, or will they go out on their own to, you know, drive their own endeavors and then become an independent third party? Um, I suppose it's it's an interesting dynamic, and I think it's it's one to watch how the role will, will evolve. Um, my I suppose my words to MSL and medical advisors are: if it's your passion, do it. Um, you know the the needs of the pharmaceutical industry and of the roles will evolve if you know depending on where people move and and how it it begins to develop. Um, but yeah, it's an evolving space, and I think um, you know people's bravery is starting to come through where they're willing to take steps kind of in new directions. So yeah, watch this space and anything is possible um, once somebody has the drive and the passion to do it. I couldn't help but see that you also have a similar ring to me. I wasn't sure if you're wearing oh. an aura ring. Is that your aura uh, ring? No, 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 no. It's just a blue glass ring. Uh, blue okay, because I thought that you're also a biohacker and my ring helps to study, uh, you know, my respiration and my sleep and everything. And I was ah. just saying another great way for you to get in, in tune with the way your body mechanics are working. So yes, 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 yes. No, sadly it's not, but uh, <laughs> it's yeah. a beautiful ring anyway. Um, any, th any final thoughts on people overcoming fear? Okay. So I suppose the first step is to be aware that you are fearful. So a lot of people, don't even know that they are fearful. They're making decisions on autopilot. And so if you feel that there's resistance in your body or if you feel you're kind of, nothing new is happening in your world or nothing innovative is happening in your job, 
you need to stop and say there must be fear somewhere. And it's about connecting back to it. Uh, because a lot of people say, I'm not fearful. But, and I suppose I was once in that place, no, I'm not fearful, but I didn't realize how much subconscious fear I had until I began to say I wanted to do something different. Cause I was like, you know, my everyday is not as impactful as I want it to be. And so as you begin to make that change, tap into that fear. And once you connect with that energy and you connect with that need to, you know, be brave or have courage, it will give you the energy to move, to move forward. So. I love it. It is such a great way to, uh, to sort of end this conversation and just a sort of a, a plug for uh, on that note around uh, pursuing your dream, shipping your art and, and really creating a movement. I wrote a book called the healthcare heretic. Uh, anybody can check it out. It's on audible and Amazon as well, but um, this was an outstanding conversation. I think there is so much interest, intrigue, and excitement uh, in the medical space. I love the the approach that you're taking at, at this from a vibrational space. And I think really, quite frankly, bringing the emotional and the spiritual into a place of conversation. And I love where you're taking that. And I'm going to obviously be watching your space. For anybody who's interested in speaking with Emma, um, any of the courses that she's launching or has now and will be launching in 2021, any of your organizations who might want to have your groups going through this, we will be leaving links to connect with Emma in the show notes below. So please be on the watch for that. Um, we also encourage you to check out impetusdigital.com. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to have continuous interactions asynchronously or synchronously, we have an amazing platform with some of the most comprehensive tools for you to have some of these stakeholder conversations longitudinally over time with a myriad of different people, advisors, payers, patients, um, building these trusting insights. And so we'd invite you to check that out. Please like this video or subscribe. It helps others to find our material. Thank you everybody for your time. I appreciate Emma. This was an awesome conversation and wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead. See you. Bye.